I'll tell you something, it's a, it's a different audience. I've never, I speak to investors all the time, I speak to the politicians, the policy makers all the time, uh, I speak to uh, the, the energy companies, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's utilities, um, and I speak to the technology providers, but I don't get many grid operators, ISO, and I don't get many detailed regulators and the sorts of people you've got here. Just an, it's a really interesting crowd. Whenever you ask investors what they want from energy policy, they will always ask for essentially one of two things. They'll either ask for long-term predictability, um, or they'll ask for money. Um, so they, they want more support, more subsidy, more this, more that. And I think it's really dangerous. I think you, you, know, you have to listen to them. I don't want to say don't listen to them, but it's really diff dangerous to take them at face value because actually, what they really want, if they ask for long-term uh, um, predictability in terms of just tell me the price and tell me the price for 20 years so that I can go and get it financed at the lowest cost, then that's just not a realistic demand. What, they, what, they, what is a legitimate uh, request by the investor and the developer community is to say, I want predictability in the sense, I want to know what the framework is. I'm going to compete over the price. I don't, that's not a problem. That's, what, that's how people innovate and they come up with new service propositions and they build their alliances and, uh, uh, and they innovate in, um, new technologies in order to, to be able to compete at better price points. But they need to know that there's a framework there to compete into. And that's part of the problem when those frameworks are sort of put up for two, three years and you just get up to speed and then, and then suddenly they're changed. And, and that's, the, the, that's the danger. The, in, and then in terms of, you know, if they just simply ask for money, and we have a lot of that around the world, of people complaining, oh, there was this subsidy and then there's not this subsidy. My answer to that is, I'm not listening. I, I think you've got, to, you've got to move away from measuring the success of policy by how much subsidy it delivers. And there's, there's far, far too much of that, to be honest. You know, it's not a fashionable word. But look at the airline industry, look at the telecoms and internet industries. Both of them, the technology came out of national labs or the military. Um, it needed support. In the case of airlines, um, they were national airlines. That was how the airline industry got built, was around na essentially national airlines. Um, the technology always fairly military. In the case of uh, telecoms and the internet, a lot of it was built through the academic, went from the military to the academic community, heavily, heavily, in a sense, regulated or, or, or controlled by governments. But you know, you wouldn't have a JetBlue or an EasyJet or a BMI, which is another of the low-cost airlines. Actually, it's not; even, it's, it's a huge airline now. You wouldn't have that unless we had deregulated at the right time the airline industry, and you wouldn't have the Vodafones and the Sprints, and you also wouldn't have, by the way the Snapchats, the Vibers, the Facebooks, if the telecoms industry had remained as heavily regulated as the energy industry is currently. So the question is, when you've got these renewable energy technologies to a certain point, solar, six, seven cents, levelized costs at the retail on the rooftop, it's, I don't know, 12 cents, 11 cents, 10 cents, there comes a point where you just say, do you know what? Hands off, we're gonna take the, all of the supports away. Fossil fuel, nuclear, renewables, capacity markets, which ones, what's the barest minimum set that would enable new entrants to flood in and offer uh, innovative services? And um, that may be an ideal, but it's an ideal that's worth thinking about. Um, and then, you know, only coming back, there, there are issues of geopolitics, there are issues of the energy poor. There are issues of disruption to services, you know, medical services through blackouts, which you can't allow, and so on. But don't back off to the point where government is deciding what technology uh, gets bought at what price point and delivered to which customers, because then in entrepreneurs will be gone. That's it. No, there'll, be, there'll be no innovation. Everywhere where it's sunny, we've got to the point where solar rooftops deliver power competitively with the price on the network. And so uh, it, it starts to make sense around the sunny world to, to, to do the rooftops. And we see this obviously in California, but you see it 
everywhere where it's sunny. And um, of course, for the utilities, that's a big problem because they start to lose a chunk of demand um, during the day. And then along comes Elon Musk with his power wall and talks about storage, and everybody immediately jumps to the conclusion that this will be energy independence. You'll be off grid. You'll be off grid. It's fantastic. You'll be off grid. It's a, it's, it's a bright new uh, tomorrow. We'll all be off grid. The problem is that to be off grid, you don't just need to go through one 24 hour period. You need to go through every 24 hour period when it's raining, during the winter, um, uh, when you've got a heavy energy load, when you run your dishwasher at the same time as your washing machine, at the same time as your uh, kids are, uh, are on the uh, gaming, uh, on, the, on the Xbox or whatever. And that is much different, that requires a much different set of, uh, amount of storage than just a power wall. You know, you're going to have to invest very substantially. So what you're going to do is put the solar on your roof, you're going to have some storage because then you'll be able to self-generate more, particularly in markets, not net metering markets, but in the other markets, so you'll be able to self-generate more, but you'll still have a grid connection. So what the utility will see, though, is not grid defection, but load defection. So if they're charging, if they want to pay for their infrastructure, all the wires, all of the, the, the substation, everything they do, and they want to pay for that by selling kilowatt hours, but their customer is saying, oh, actually, I've got a better way to do that. You, it, it requires a complete um, restructuring of the rate, uh, a complete new rate structure. And this is the f forefront. This is what is being discussed around the world. And it's all about you know, fixed charges to cover the grid connection. The problem is I think it needs to be not a fixed charge, but charge for services. Charge for services. And the services that the homeowner or the small business needs are, for instance, um, Yes, they need to buy some power at the times they need it because you know, if it's rainy for two weeks, then you'll buy some power. But the rest of the time, they'll generate too much and so they'll have to sell power. Well, they want somebody to help them with that. A homeowner doesn't know how to sell electricity, but somebody can aggregate all those bits of excess, put it together into a package and sell it into an electricity market if, such, if the right sort and the right contract structures and technologies exist. Um, if you've now got solar on the roof, you've got a battery, you've got all sorts of sophisticated lighting systems, uh, uh, you know, LED based and they're controlled. Who's going to maintain these assets? This has become a complicated system. Somebody has to maintain that. Somebody needs to tell you when you need to clean your solar panels or when your inverter has um, given up the ghost. Uh, needs to warn you perhaps that, uh, that, that something's overheating and that you need to, to do some maintenance. Um, and of course, if it does break down, you need power because it's going to break down right in the middle uh, of the, um, you know, the Super Bowl is when it's going to break down. That's when you want it to fail over and have grid supply. So those are each services that you need. And that's what your retailer, the, the customer facing utility, should be selling those services. And at that point, the homeowner will say, OK, I get it. I'm getting value. I've got, I've got backup. I've got insurance. I've got management of my asset. I've got, uh, I, I'm being helped to buy cheaply. I'm being helped to sell my surplus. And I'll pay for those. Whereas if some regulator comes in heavy handed and says, sorry, it's $50 a month, you say, for what? And what's the choice? That's not the way to reform the market, to just impose in a sense, a, a, what, what we in the UK call a poll tax, just a tax per household. The interesting thing about the transition to clean energy, though, is that, of course, electricity is only, it's less than 30% of primary energy worldwide. So we can spend a lot of time talking to ourselves about electricity and this tremendous transformation, which is happening, there's no question. Some people still not that, you know, don't want to believe it, but it is. Um, but you've got to talk about transportation, and that's obviously you know, personal, it's also freight, and it's aircraft, which are a very difficult problem to solve. And you've got to talk about heat, whether it's heat in the home, heat in the office, heat in the factory, process uh, heat. Um, you've got to talk about that, because we're not going to solve the trans the, the transformation isn't done until that piece is done too. And there's lots of stuff there, there's lots of low-hanging fruit in terms of um, energy efficiency, insulation, different industrial processes, additive manufacturing, etc., etc. That's really not started. So we've got electricity, 12 years ago was kind of a crazy dream, but now is happening. 
transport is now starting to happen, driven partly by climate, but a lot of it is driven by air quality and by just the, the you know, people really got a shock about high oil costs over the last uh, sort of decade, and and so a lot of a lot there's a lot of um, innovation around very efficient engines and de-weighting the cars so that they weigh less and so on. Uh, so transportation, and then of course the whole shared ownership around transportation, that's a huge opportunity as well. Uh, and then heat is the sort of is the sort of slowest one to really uh, yeah. go. But I think all, all of them are going. And what I'd say also on the transition to clean energy is that transitions, once, once they look inevitable, then the discussion for every player is, when do I get involved? And uh, not, do I get involved? Or, and there's no, there's no money to be made in resisting it, in a sense. So that therefore, whether it's your home, or your business, or your country, or your, your county, your, your state, you just say, well, how do I play this to my advantage? This is where we're going, that's clear, I now see it. How do I play it to my advantage? I want the jobs, I want to save money, I want to, I, you know, I want to improve, you know, I want the, um, the kudos of being a leader, or maybe I don't, but I'm definitely gonna shift. And I think that's where we are now. We're in the definitely going to shift uh, zone.